Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Reactions to the cancellation of the Jamaica Festival Song Competition. Strong opposition against suggestion for government to sit with gang leaders to deal with the crime problem. And later in sports, Waterhouse and Dunby Holen book their semi-final spots in the Jamaica Premier League. I'm Krista Campbell and here are the details. At least one veteran musician believes politics is to be blamed for the cancellation of the Jamaica Festival Song Competition this year. On Wednesday, Culture and Entertainment Minister Olivia Babsy Grange told Parliament that the, the, the competition would not be held due to the poor quality of songs. Anthony Logg has our story. <laughs> It's part of the Jamaican culture for decades, having a new festival song each year. But just like 2017, there will be no new song for Jamaicans to revel in, even though the country will be celebrating 60 years of independence. It's why there's a call for the Jamaica Cultural Development Commission, JCDC, to be stripped of responsibility for holding the Jamaica Festival Song Competition. According to veteran musician Grub Cooper, he believes there is too much political interference with the competition. If you want to get this thing right, two things I have to say. Take the competition out of the hands of the JCDC. Make it be privatized. The JCDC will endorse the winner, just like the other medals that people would have won, you know, in culinary arts, dance, etc., etc. Because there is too much interference. Former chairman of the Jamaica Festival Song Competition Committee, Vernon Darby, has a different view. He believes there's a boycott of the competition by musicians and producers. I predicted years ago that one year would have it. And last year I predicted again that you would not have it this year. And I'm correct. We need to look is that a man of a sore. He has a high temperature. I want to realize that he has a sore. He's just looking at the high temperature. One, there's a structural problem in terms of the organization. The organization has not had a head for probably four or five years. That's the first stage. Two, the persons who are involved in the business you don't understand the festival song thing at all. Reggae musician Freddie McGregor, who was one of the judges on the festival song panel, says he could only identify one worthy song from the 30 he listened. He says there's a need for workshops particularly geared at writing. The lyrical sure. contents are really important. Added to that, you know, people need to understand is that every person who writes a song can necessarily or should necessarily be the person to sing the song or perform the song. That's why we have songwriters, and we have singers, we have DJs, we have actors, etc. Now, one of the things I found out is that when, when we listen to a song, that you could say, yeah, this one is not so bad. Rhythmically or musically, um, the vocal, now cut it in plain Jamaican words, not cutting it, and vice versa. They were all speaking on Radio Jamaica's Beyond the Headlines last evening. Culture and Entertainment Minister Olivia Grange says 123 entries were received this year for the competition. She said the number was lower than previous years. Anthony Lug, TVJ News. The Bauxite Community Development Program, BCDP, is intensifying its contributions to healthcare facilities in communities affected by bauxite mining. This comes after mounting complaints from residents about the negative effects of mining. Now, as Kalisha Williams reports, the BCDP has launched a $20 million project at the Black River Hospital in St. Elizabeth. Bauxite mining in St. Elizabeth has been plagued by problems, from protests and complaints over a dust nuisance to bauxite company Jisco Alpart having to fork out $40 million to compensate residents in 2020. Now, the Bauxite Community Development Program, BCDP, is taking things a step further. The BCDP Advisory Board had scheduled our plan for investment or reinvestment, considerable investment in our health sector. This is just one of many such investments that we have on the table. So what exactly are they doing here? Black River is not near mining areas, but the hospital is one of the main facilities that has been treating residents for complications resulting from bauxite pollution. And so the BCDP has decided to invest more funds here to help with service delivery. We, we were approached by the hospital and they had communicated first and foremost that uh, there was a difficulty because the entrance and exit is very clustered. And so what that causes is it causes a bottleneck all along this corridor. 
and poses difficulty particularly as well for emergency vehicles to exit and enter the premises. The project will cost the BCDP about $20 million. Project manager for St. Elizabeth Health Services, Sean Brissett, said the hospital has been calling for its entrance to be expanded for over seven years now. This plan where you have a regulated environment where one vehicle will flow on one side, one will flow on the other side, going in and out depending on which, which direction you're heading, um, will provide a seamless flow. In addition, on entering the facility, you find that um, the vehicle, there's a, there's a kind of inset where the vehicle, vehicles coming in will be able to e position themselves coming in so it will not interfere with vehicles flowing on, on, on the road. Plans are also underway to invest in healthcare facilities in other communities affected by bauxite mining. Kelisha Williams, TVJ News. Reactions this afternoon to State Minister Homer Davis's proposal for the government to sit with gang leaders to deal with the crime situation plaguing the country. The issue was discussed on the morning agenda on Power 106. Kirk Wright tells us more. With concerns about the number of people murdered in Jamaica each year, the government is in a race against time to deal with the crime problem. It's the reason the Minister of State, with responsibility for the OPM's Western Jamaica office, Homer Davis, proposed that the police invite gang leaders to a sit-down as part of efforts to tame the crime monster. The proposal has since been met with strong criticism, both from the police and Minister of National Security, Dr. Horace Chang. Now, opposition spokesman on national security, Peter Bunting, believes the government is losing the fight against crime. A government, through the policy leadership, cannot be seen in any way to be legitimizing criminal, dons, or organized crime leadership by calling them in for some sort of um, appeasement meeting. Mm -hmm. That is sending the wrong signals to the society and to the community. But Justice Minister Delroy Chuck believes there is some merit to the proposal. As far as I can see, if within communities, the political directorate can work with the pastors, to work with the police, to see if they can bring these citing gangs to the table to explain their differences, to try to sort out their problems, then there's no doubt in my mind that it is possible. In the meantime, Mr. Bunting is also criticizing the government for its handling of crime. He reasoned that with the resources available to the Holiness Administration, there should be a reduction in crime. Crime problem has emerged over a long period of time and it's not going to be solved in one administration, in one four-year period. However, I think we had, we were using the correct strategies, and I think if we had anywhere near the resources that's available, that have been available to the government over the last six years, we would have done much better. Mr. Chuck added that the police by themselves cannot deal with the criminal network island-wide. He says there's a need for a holistic approach to deal with crime. Let me say this, and you know, I be careful when I speak, because you have situations now, look at the gang trial, where there are persons in authority who are embedded with these gangs. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to capture the evidence is extremely difficult. Kirk Wright, TVJ News. And it's time for a break now, but stay with us. More stories when the Midday News returns. Welcome back to the Midday News. The Health Ministry and the St. Mary Health Department are being taken to task for the poor state of the Fellowship Hall Clinic in the parish, O'Shane Masters reports. Residents told the TVJ News that the facility which serves five communities on a monthly basis has seemingly been neglected by the health authorities. They told our news team that, among other things, there's a constant water problem. We are having a hard time here right now. You can't use the bathroom. What's the use of the bathroom if it cannot be used? So many people. Old people like me have to wear pampers. When the rain set this place leak, look out there. There's no water ever. Jumps, 
When the rain falls, that's the only time it is full. And most time it has mosquitoes and all of that. But while at the location, our news team saw this van coming with a drum of water. But the residents contend that's still not enough. No, that is not sufficient. We want more than that. Water is supposed to in the line that they can get to use in the clinic. In the meantime, they are appealing to the health authorities to improve the health facility in their community. The government and the, the MP need to see about the well-being of the citizens here in Fellowship Hall. In the mornings when the patients come, we have to be standing outside, whether rain or shine. We have to be standing outside, no shelter, until 9 o'clock when the workers are here. Some people don't get through because you have a lot of people, so I'm saying they could have another day for doctor. They only come once a month, so probably twice a month would have been better for up here. Oshane Masters, TVJ News. And the St. Mary Health Department says several checks were made before the clinic date, which revealed that water was at the location. Um, the maintenance team did inform me that they went by to do checks on the supply a week before and water was in the tank. So it was a bit surprising when we got the call the evening that there wasn't any water in the tank. And so the necessary arrangements were made for water to be transported there yes. and uh, that was done. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any service that was um, uh, affected on the day. Uh, we also did some checks on the valve system mm -hmm. and there wasn't any leak um, observed from the maintenance team. Now, par parish manager of the health department, Cherie Wallace, believes residents from the community may have used the water. So what we have observed is that from time to time, when the water is not in the community, we'll find that members from the community might come across to get water access. More concerns this afternoon about the traffic nightmare in the town of Mandeville, Manchester. The matter was discussed at Thursday's meeting of the Municipal Corporation. At a function in the parish a week ago, Prime Minister Andrew Honis promised the traffic situation will be addressed soon, but the councillors want something done now. We had put together something to make the life of the people of Mandeville a little better, and of course, to a wider extent, the parish. And it is taking so long. And I mean, you can't tell the common man on the road when he asks you. So boy, we send it to ministry, you know, and it forgets it, and it, it, it that not mean nothing to them. And we continue as director to be blamed. Meanwhile, councillor for the New Green Division, MacArthur Collins, said the congestion has been crippling both private and public sector businesses in Mandeville. The post office, tax office, and research agencies, them out there. And if you drive around here now, the truck will do the unloading for the supermarket up on uh, both sides of the road. Some of words in the one way sign to are going from here to here. No parking places out there. And for a look at the economy, here's Cordian Barrett with the Business Minute. In the world of business, tourism minister Edmund Bartlett is encouraging tourism entities to pivot and pursue ideas and innovations, which will drive the industry's continued recovery from the fallout caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our thrust in recovery is not about the competitive nature of the past. That tourism's recovery for it to be meaningful and to be strong and effective for us and to contribute more to the growth of our economy has not to be a reset, but a reimagining. In business internationally, prices in the U.S. rose faster than expected last month as rising energy and food costs pushed inflation to the highest rate since 1981. The annual inflation rate rose to 8.6% in May. The rising cost of living has been squeezing households and putting pressure on policymakers to bring the issue under control. 
And coming up in the business review this Sunday, at first it was poultry, now Sandside Farm is in the business of making honey to make some money. And that's it for the Business Minute this week. Time now for the top regional and international stories with O'Shane Masters. In the region, churches and non-governmental organizations, NGOs, have written to Prime Minister of St. Kitts, Dr. Timothy Harris, urging him to name a date for the general election. In their June 8 letter, the churches and the NGOs listed several issues they want the relevant authorities to take into consideration, including a pre-election period of sensitivity, neutrality in the electoral process, the delay in announcing the election date, and the abuse of office. Dr. Harris is yet to announce a date for the election after he dismissed several of his ministers, asked the Governor-General to dissolve Parliament as his coalition team unity government collapsed because of internal wrangling. Legislators of two of the coalition of the People's Action Movement and the Concerned Citizens Movement that controlled seven of the nine seats in cabinet had filed a motion of no confidence in Dr. Harris, but he scuttled that move by having the parliament dissolved. On the international scene, India's daily COVID-19 infection rate has nearly doubled, bringing fears of a possible new and fourth wave of the pandemic. The country recorded more than 7,000 COVID cases Friday for the second consecutive day. The last time that India reported a similar single-day caseload was in early March. More than half a million people have died from COVID in India since the onset of the pandemic. And those were the top regional and international stories. I'm Oshane Masters. And we take another break here on the Midday News. And when we return, Jeremy Brown will have your Midday Sports Support. Stay tuned. Welcome back. It's now time for your lunchtime sports. Chasing 276 for victory, the West Indies were 115 for four after 22 overs. This against Pakistan in the second one-day international in Moulton. Rovman Powell and Captain Nicholas Poran are at the crease. Kyle Mayers made a 33, while Jamaica's Brandon King went without scoring. Shamar Brooks also added 38. Earlier, Pakistan posted 275 for eight after electing to bat. Captain Babar Azam top scored with 77, while Imam Ul Haq made 72. The pair shared in a 120 run second wicket partnership. Akil Hussain took 3 for 52, while Alzari Joseph had 2 for 33, and Anderson Phillip 2 for 50. And staying on cricket, Jamaica's women made it 2 from 2 at the Cricket West Indies T20 Blaze tournament. After defeating the Windward Islands women by 25 runs in a low-scoring affair at the Providence Stadium in Guyana on Thursday evening. The Jamaicans were first dismissed for 91 in 19.3 overs after being sent to bat. Rashada Williams the top scored with 24, while Captain Stefani Taylor made 18. And Janila Glasgow took 4 for 21 for the Windwards. Now, in reply, the Windwards were blown away for just 66 in 16.4 overs. Medium pacer Jody Ann Morgan grabbing 3 for 15 uh, from 2.4 overs for the Jamaican women. Taylor also took 2 for 15 and Vanessa Watts 2 for 5 as Jamaica won their second straight match at the tournament. And they had also defeated Trinidad and Tobago in their opening match on Tuesday. Some football news now. Waterhouse and Dunby Holden confirmed their semi-final spots in the Jamaica Premier League following their rescheduled matches on Thursday at the Anthony Spaulding Sports Complex. Waterhouse edged Harborview 2-1 through an own goal from O'Shane Staple and Cardell Benbow in, the, in minutes 13 and 21 respectively. Colorado Murray, well, he pulled one back for Harborview in first half stoppage time. With the win, Waterhouse moved to 49 points atop the standings. Six more than second place to Dunby Holden. Dunby Holden were held straight one all draw by defending champions Cavalier FC in the opening match of what was a double header. Colin Anderson gave Cavalier the lead in the 17th as equal lines for Dunby Holden in the 40th minute. Of course, both Dunby Holden and Cavalier are also through to the semi final playoffs. And that is uh, the final whistle. And that's it for your midday sports. And I am Jeremy Brown. Thank you, Jeremy. And that's it for the Midday News Package today. I'm Krista Campbell. Join us again at 7 for our primetime news package. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.